Hey, hi uh, everyone, a warm welcome for everyone for our uh, EA Global Summit 2021. And this is Mohamed from the organizing team. So before we start, as a part of an organizing team, I would like to thank everyone for your interest and joining us for the session. So this session is all about bringing structures into models where the deeper insights will be shared by Han Van Rosmelen, okay, who is a Sparks Enterprise Architect. About Han, even on his birthday, he is there to uh, take you much deeper on the topics here. Okay, so uh, it's uh, uh, to be informed. Okay, so we will be muting all the participants throughout the session. And if there is any queries during the session or uh, uh, after the session, you are welcome to post it on the chat box. So once this session is completed, you can reach the uh, presenter on the dedicated Teams channel. So additionally, if you would like to collaborate and communicate, you can do for next uh, one hour, the presenter will be staying on the Teams channel. And if you have any difficulties, you can just drop us an email on registrations at eaglobalsummit.com. And thanks again for your interest and the support. And this, I'm handing over to Han to proceed further. Okay, perfect. So Han, the stage is yours. You can start now. Thank you, Mohamed. Welcome everybody to this uh, presentation. Um, as I said to Mohamed, it's, it's still a bit warm because I added the last notes uh, five minutes ago. Um, so it's a work in progress and everything I do seems to be a work in progress. Um, I will talk, to, uh, I will talk uh, about um, the use of uh design structure or dependency structure matrices uh, by for, for helping you understanding systems and or applications so that the subjects that i will discuss today are what is a design or uh, dependency structure matrix i can imagine that not all of you have ever seen a dependency structure matrix so i will show what it is and i will tell you how it can help you in understanding a system uh, or an application. Um, I will also show you how you can uh, use dependency structure matrix matrices uh, for better structuring of applications and or your EA models. And I will show that you can uh, combine EA models with your actual source code in a single dependency structure matrix. And one of the advantages of that is that you have an integral traceability over your model as well as your code. Um, the world we live in uh, looks like uh, the picture on the left. Uh, when we put that into a matrix, it's more uh, easy to understand. But you can go as far as uh, Microsoft did with uh, uh, MFC, and that is not how a DSM or a system should look like. Who am I? I am um, Han van Roosmalen. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm one of the three amigos of uh, eXpertise, uh, and I hope you will find time to see their presentations as well. We have a different, we all have a different backgrounds. Uh, so our presentations are very different from each other. Um, I work with the EA since version six, and I work with uh, DSM since uh, 2003, and I gave various talks on dependency structure matrices at various worldwide conferences. What I do for a daily living is um, uh, providing consultancy and training to my customers, and currently I have uh, two parallel activities, uh, the one one bigger than the other one. Uh, currently, I help uh, a large data modeling team at uh, Dutch Railways for creating a better EA model. And I work for Hearing Holland, a smaller company where I help um, the product manager uh, designing uh, system configurations and product lines. On the right, you see myself and a capuchin monkey. I'm not sure why I put that uh, picture in place, but I do have something with capuchin monkeys. As you might know, capuchin monkeys 
are real wild animals and they are the most intelligent monkeys on the planet. They're less intelligent than apes like uh, orangutans and uh, gorillas, but they are very smart. And sometimes I think we have a lot of capuchin monkeys in IT. Dependency structure matrices and models are have to do with complexity. So what is complexity? In my humble opinion, complexity of a system, the overall complexity of a system is the product of complexity of the structure of the system and the complexity of the domain. If you rephrase it uh, a little, then it's C system is C structure times uh, C domain. I have to make a small side note because Albert Einstein uh, uh, invented the formula ESMC quadrat, uh, ESMC square. And I think there must be a square in one of the C's on the right side. And I'm not sure where. The domain complexity is extremely hard to change. It's very hard to change physics or governments that come with all kinds of rules and regulations and laws and such. Some domains are difficult to understand, to comprehend and to model. So that's not where we can help with DSMs. Where we can help with DSMs and architecture is on the structural side. So we have only in this formula, we have only one parameter that we can influence for better or for worse. Uh, if we define and design, define and design a, a better structure, then uh, the C structure will be less, uh, will be less. So the product of it will also become less. And that parameter is influenced by the architecture. Uh, lousy architectures have a big C structure. So what we have to do, what we have to achieve is that we can get inside control and oversight in the architecture. The way we do that is with models, like doing what we do in uh, Spark CA and with matrices. And in my opinion, an architecture is just a pattern of boxes and arrows. So what we do as an architect is drawing boxes and arrows in certain patterns. Some patterns better than the other. Maybe you've never heard of design structure matrices. Um, they are around uh, quite some time. Uh, the first DSMs uh, were this, were, were, the, the, the methodology was defined by Stephen Eppinger and Tyson Browning in the, uh, the 1970s. And the method was used to create and design complex systems. The interesting thing about DSMs is that in itself, DSMs are not complex. Creating a DSM is not complex. So where DSMs are used for is, in many cases, a redesign of a complex system or just a design or a validation of the complexity. They can also be used by project planning and for uh, traceability. In IT, DSMs are one of the most interesting means to move from legacy to microservice architectures and reusing code that is involved in those microservice architectures. There are many DSM tools for software development available. I named just a few, Structure one on one and Dependalytics. And you can find more information on the dsmweb.org website on other commercial tools. Um, I do a spoiler alert first. Uh, Latex is not free, but by far the best that I have found. And the only one that has connections to EA. Okay, the dependency or design structure matrix is 
in itself pretty easy to understand. Here you see a dependency structure matrix, and what you see on the in, in the in the column is the same as in the row. So the diagonal is the projection of the dependencies between uh, the element itself, and this and this cross and this cross mean this cross means that uh, B has a connection to C, and C has a connection to E. And D has a connection to R. What you see in this uh, DSM is that there are connections from top to bottom, but also from bottom to top. These are circular dependencies, and that's uh, and it is proven that circular dependencies uh, make understanding a system more difficult. Uh, software system that has a lot of dependencies above the diagonal is very hard to understand and maintain. So what dependency structure matrices tools try to achieve is that by doing some calculations, they try to push all the dependencies below the diagonal, as you see in this, in this uh, matrix. So what you don't want is dependencies above the diagonal. And as you, if you see you here, this is a bigger system and here there are dependencies above and below the diagonal. So this system is more easy to understand than this system. Though this is a technical uh, decomposition and when we make a logical decomposition out of it, uh, by putting the intended architecture in this matrix, then it might change a lot. <clears throat> to achieve uh, or to help you getting better insight in the complexity of a system, DSM partitioning is a very nice uh, way of working. Some tools provide based on the numbers of the dependencies inside a matrix can help you to automatically find components, elements that are uh, interfacing with each other, elements that are closer to each other, etc. So partitioning helps us to do some ordering in DSMs. We can order them by hand, but sometimes algorithms can do it much faster than you can do. The examples that I show here are not the best examples that I will show you, but it gives an idea. <clears throat> so you can have software uh, system or model DSMs, or the combination of all of them. A DSM, when you load a model or code into a DSM, instantly shows you the realized architecture or in safe terms the emergent architecture so what you want to do with a dsm is put the intended architecture in and read from a model or source code the emergent architecture and what you will find is the degree of loose coupled systems and their interdependencies so if you look from top to bottom, it's, it can provide you a way to help um, improve your model or your code. It can help you to refactor the code because you get a higher level of visibility of your system application than you can have with doing normal refactorings. A DSM gives you a higher overview than a model does because it overlooks your model and i will show you in a minute how that works but you can also look in a dsm from bottom to top if you change an element inside a dsm it will show what higher level elements or modules or systems system components are affected so if you model your unit tests inside your DSM 
and you change a class inside your, your, your mark, a class inside your DSM has changed, you will automatically see what unit tests are uh, touched by that change. And if nothing is touched, then maybe you have to uh, add some unit tests for that specific change. <clears throat> the interesting thing about EA and Latix is that um, Latix can read in EAP and EAPX files, and you can see Latix as a kind of um, drone that flies over uh, over your system and shows the system at the highest level, but also can dive down very fast into details. <clears throat> On the left side, you see a DSM that I have loaded into uh, Latix of the EA example EA, EAP file provided by Spark Systems. When you look in the left uh, matrix, it's very difficult to comprehend what is happening here. The only thing you can see is that the model seems to be scattered around and that there are some areas that are larger than other areas. So EA 15 examples and enterprise architecture make, up third, make out 30% of the dependencies between the, uh, between the rest, uh, uh, the, the size of the dependencies. So those parts of the model contain the most elements and dependencies. So just by using the component partitioning algorithm, um, Latix finds out that there is one, two, three, four components. And it brings together the top seven components uh, that have a large interaction with each other. So it will see that as a single component. That's maybe not what you want in your model. Maybe you want only uh, a, a smaller uh, dependencies between uh, parts in your model. Like here, in this, this area, there are no interdependencies between these elements in those packages of the example uh, repository. But there are dependencies between, say, the core part of the model and the more leaf part of the model here and there. This is based, this, this DSM is based on just doing calculations on the left uh, part. So maybe it does not really uh, represent your idea of the complete model uh, as, uh, as being fit to what you know about it. So in that case, you can move uh, packages around and improve uh, the way the DSM looks like. The interesting thing about Latix is that when you make changes to your EAP file and you reread your project, it will uh, keep the changes that you made to the structure in place and put the changes that were made in your model uh, in the matrix again. Yep. I hope you get a bit of an understanding of uh, what a DSM is about. When I drill down in the EA, uh, EA example EAP file, I find this, uh, this diagram and it looks like this in the in the DSM. So elements in this diagram are reused by other parts of uh, the model. And there is an internal structure looking like this. And on line 28, you see that all the elements are on the diagram. But here you see the dependencies between the elements, and which are the lines in the diagram. 
what you also can see is, hey, there are um, uh, there's stuff in the DSM that doesn't have any relationships. And if you start looking for this diagram and this diagram, you'll find that they are empty. Not a very good example. <clears throat> so what I'm looking at when I'm uh, I'm looking at at the component structures uh, in a DSM is looking for elements that are below dependencies that are below and above the diagonal. So here you find 18 dependencies below the diagonal and two dependencies underneath the diagonal. And that that triggers me because there is a reason for this. And I have to want to know why this is a why this reason exists. So I found the two di uh, diagrams and what you see here is that in normal situations, in normal modeling, in, in, in most of the diagrams and the models, there's a realization a relationship going from a requirement to another uh, element. But in this particular diagram, you find that there's an element pointing to the requirements. That's the opposite direction. So this too might be a modeling mistake. And maybe there are more of these, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, inconsistencies. You can also use a DSM for traceability. And the interesting thing about traceability in a tool like Lettix is that you don't have to select one type of element and a package uh, in, in, in the row and one and another type of package and element types in uh, the columns. For Lettix, it doesn't matter. So you can easily see uh, what element is connected to other elements. So what you see here is that requirement 110 has a relationship with an element in system engineering. So by looking at the requirements, you will find that there is traceability. But you can imagine that if you have traceability to something in software engineering, that might have a connection into your uh, in, into another part of the model. So you can go from your requirements down to uh, other elements just by following the numbers uh, in the in the in the DSM. <clears throat> As I said before, you can also uh, do some uh, change uh, impact, determine change impact. For instance, there is a test suit in the EA example. EAP file called open orders. It has two test cases, uh, list current orders and package orders. You can find them here. These are, these two lines are these two uh, ones. And if you go back in the DSM, you will find that these elements are linked to a use case called list current orders. So if you use open orders, the test case open orders, or uh, checking the list current orders, you know that you have this connection. So you can imagine that you create other test cases that don't have connections to use cases, or that uh, and use cases are missing, or et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm going from bottom to top. <clears throat> the interesting thing about uh, using uh, a, a tool like Lattex is that it can show you the intended versus the emerging architecture. So you can create your, your models to represent the intended architecture. 
uh, for instance, uh, component diagrams or uh, other diagrams um, that are helpful to try to express what you try to achieve in your intended architecture. It's a good practice to use logical components for that because your technical components will come from your uh, source code or your data tables in your database. Um, so the first step you do is load your um, EA model into a DSM and after that load the application files into the DSM. And then move uh, the interesting application parts into the intended architecture that comes from your EA model. When that happens, you will see that the DSM will show you the resulting will show you the result of this. So you can find out if an application is correctly structured. Does it fit the intended architecture or was your development team like a, a bunch of capuchins and they went their own way? What areas in the software or in your model are complex and maybe you have to redesign them? What parts or what changes can you make to do significant refactorings? And if you intend to use your current software to move from your silo application to microservices, what can we use or reuse in those microservices? So what I did here is I uh, created a very small uh, EA model, a really small EA model that only has uh, some uh, some diagrams in it, and I created a kind of a logical decomposition of what this system should do. It's a, it's a system. Uh, an application that I found on uh, on GitHub um, that has the title Hospital CRM, but if you look inside the application, it's it's very uh, small, uh, but uh, very helpful to uh, for this presentation. So what I did, I created the APX file and loaded it to uh, the DSM tool. I also read in the C sharp code by uh, reading the solution file from Visual Studio. And then I started this, and then I have two uh, matrices in one. So this is the matrix of the Sparks model, and this is the matrix of the .NET source code. And now we are going to show what the intended architecture should represent and is resolved by the software. So I'm starting to move those classes to components, I say logical components that I have modeled in my EA model. So I'm slowly moving code from my, uh, or code representations from my .NET model into my Sparks model. And you see that all kinds of relationships are going to exist between the, uh, the EA model and the source code. So here I get some traceability uh, logic. I can do that on various, uh, with various intentions. Um, and, 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 and that's a way to create multi-domain DSMs. Uh, so in the previous slide, I showed you a domain model of a, a DSM of a domain model and uh, a, a software uh, system. But I can also map requirements to modeled uh, elements in EA and implemented components in source code. 
I can also map user stories to modeled elements in EA and implemented components or data tables. I can map uh, my uh, staff to modeled elements and components. So I can have traceability over multiple model sources. And that's where the fun starts. <clears throat> Here's an example of tracing requirements from the application. So I have uh, defined a number of requirements into the logical uh, elements. But because I dragged the technical elements from the source code, so the classes from the source code, into this part of the model, I instantly have the relationships between uh, the model, the requirements of the model, the, model the, the, the logical decomposition in the model and the source code, and a mapping to uh, elements or, 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 or components in the software that map to uh, system of technology elements. So what you see here is the requirements domain and the application domain, and this is the technology domain. Well, that's nice if you have uh, created a, a, a nice uh, intended architecture and you did uh, move the uh, software elements into uh, into in, into your model part then you will find that there are dependencies above the diagonal and here the work of the architect starts because in this tool i can say okay i'm not i'm not allowing dependencies in this area or in this area or maybe somewhere here so that means that when I re, uh, re, uh, read my uh, EA model and my uh, uh, solution file, <clears throat> that it could be that dependencies arise in the next release of your uh, software. And in that case, you're notified, hey, okay, there are some dependencies that are not allowed. So in that case, you find a reason for doing refactoring as fast as possible because these numbers will grow in the meantime because those capuchin monkeys are still working on software and they think they are doing the right stuff. So in this case, you can say, okay, dear capuchin monkey, please remove those dependencies because you're ruining the intended architecture. And therewith, uh, the maintenance quality of this system. <clears throat> I have another other example. Uh, currently, I'm working for, as, as I said before, I work for the Dutch Railways, the Nederlandse Spoorwegen, and there, uh, about uh, 30 models are working on a data model that will fill um, the data warehouse of various business units within the organization. When I came in, <clears throat> all the people were working just in this area. And what we found out is that they changed each other's elements. There was no ownership of elements and data tables. Uh, they created uh, all kinds of diagrams and uh, Models found out that their colleagues were changing their models. And so the model that I uh, I worked on was changed by somebody else. And when I'm creating a, a data warehouse, that's not very handy because at the Dutch Railways, we use the data tables in conjunction with the, the DDL generator of, of EA to create the data, the data schemas of the data warehouse. Now, if somebody is changing my um, my data table, um, 
for example, by extending it with uh, an, an extra attribute, uh, I might be in trouble because my load script will not be aware of that. So uh, after, a, after a year, there was the, the, the urge to uh, include uh, ownership into the model. So <clears throat> what I created was a repository holding the various business units. Uh, and I had some people working on moving elements from this area, especially the data model root and the werkmappen, the working packages, the work in progress packages, to their own part of the model. And what you see is that these parts will be easier to understand than this clutter of, uh, of a model. By doing so, it becomes easier to validate if a person is the real owner of an element or a data table. And it proves that when, you, when we did things like this, it was easier to deploy large data models into the data warehouse. So the goal is to uh, achieve a repository for 30 plus uh, modelers and 200 plus uh, viewers that is easy to understand. And you can imagine that if everything is cluttered here, it's very difficult to understand. So what we want to achieve by the end of this year is, by the, by the end of this year is that this part is gone and moved over to this part. And what you can see is the dependencies between the various clusters. <clears throat> and the ultimate goal is because uh, we can use this for uh, a certain level of versioning. The ultimate goal is that we are going to use Lemon Tree for model versioning. And that is easier achieved on this, uh, this kind of decomposition than on this composition. <clears throat> so when I go into the um, uh, into the model, you can see that, uh, for instance, for the cluster uh, personnel, we use uh, use cases or use stories in the backlog. We call it development. And the tables that are go that are in production are stored in this part of the model. So what I see here is that there are dependencies between elements, data tables that are still in development, and data tables that are still in production. So this is so this is from development to production. But on the other hand, there are tables in production related to elements that are still in development. So that makes it, uh, makes it very interesting and very uh, difficult. But this helps to see how far are we in moving from development to production. So what are the advantages of uh, EA and the Latex uh, combination is that uh, we, we have a way to have uh, insight and oversight on, uh, on, on large models. It's easier to determine the model quality. So what is the quality of your model? Is it, uh, is it a clump of, uh, of, of, of all kinds of, of elements and, and diagrams, or is it, uh, a bit more structured or fully structured. It's possible to align modeling with development. Uh, and the examples I showed were about code. But uh, if you have a database, Latex, and you can make a connection between Latex and the database, Latex is perfectly able to read the data schema and show a dependency structure matrix on that. Um, <clears throat> DSMs are not difficult to understand. Uh, you only have to get used to it. And uh, I have trained uh, a number of architects in DSMs and 
they get the hang of it uh, in a couple of hours and uh, they we have as uh, very ordered uh, capuchin monkeys after uh, a day or two and uh, behave like humans again uh, within a week. So that's, that's a good, uh, good thing. So it's not difficult. The learning curve of a DSM is pretty flat. Um, if you want to do some uh, refactoring of your model or, or your, or your uh, code base or your data structures, uh, then uh, you have a very good combination here. So that's very, very helpful. Um, I found a very interesting uh, hands-on picture on the internet uh, made by David Turner that explains uh, how the deep, how some of the uh, patterns in, a, in in the DSM look like, and how you can improve those uh, those patterns. So, uh, when you're interested in this, have a look at this uh, URL. And um, this is the the, the 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 part that I uh, want to talk about. Uh, I have maybe some time to give a demonstration uh, of uh, of some things uh, with with Latex NEA. I'm not sure. Uh, Mohammed, or are there questions so far? Mohammed, are you there? Okay. <clears throat> well, I can give a short demonstration of the, the, the latest example, the, the last example I gave. So here you see um, uh, the, but this is, um, this is the data source of um, of this uh, DSM, it's a EAPX file that I've created by reading in uh, by 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 uh, moving uh, a large uh, uh, SQL Server based uh, repository into an EAPX file, and this is the DSM that is created from that. And what you see here in the user interface is the these are the, the project root nodes in that model and um these the, the next level is the views are the views so there are many for this for instance this uh business unit commerce uh has a number of teams underneath uh i will focus into the the team uh driving personnel and when I go to the production part of it, uh, it's part of the uh, information architecture, then you see all kinds of, of, of objects, uh, data warehouse uh, kind of objects. And when I drill down, these are the data tables that are stored or are used for uh, this uh, this team to uh, to develop and these are the data tables in production according to the model. So what you see here is the relationships between the various data tables. And of course, you see um, dependencies above and below the diagonal. But if I do a partitioning like this. Uh, Always, always nice when uh, things change. Um, <clears throat> 
I told you that um, <clears throat> the dependency option should be um, below the diagonal, but somehow I uh, I managed to put them above the diagonal. But what you see here is that um, the model itself or the, the relationships between the data tables are only on one side of the diagonal. So there are no circular dependencies in the, in the data tables, which is a, a very nice thing to have, to have not. <clears throat> Here you see at, at this level, you see that there are dependencies between the physical data model and the logical data model. So that are those dependencies. And those logical, uh, uh, well, I think this is enough to show. I can see much more uh, when I look at this, but this is enough for now. Um, if there is interest in more um, uh, information about the DSMs, uh, please let me know. I can set up an, uh, an extra demonstration in which I can uh, answer your uh, questions and so and show more information on, on the tool itself and on the combination of EA and analytics. So far my presentation. Any questions? Hello. Perfect. So, uh, Han, I'm sorry, I have uh, missed uh, you when you asked me for. Okay, so I, yeah. uh, I was speaking over the mute, <laughs> and I have okay. just noticed it. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. What was you asking for? Well, if if um, uh, I, I can give a more presentation, I can give an, another presentation which people are who are interested in this 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 methodology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but oh, okay. it would be better to have a, a kind of a team session in which people can uh, can interact with Perfect. me and ask questions because now it's sure, very sure. It's one way now it's a one way uh, conversation yeah conversation and it, that is not that's not very helpful uh, from Perfect. this point onward I guess I understand sure. if there are any so, questions I, I I I'm willing to answer them of course mm -hmm. okay so. So I think uh, there is uh, no questions uh, raised from uh, uh, the attendees. Okay, so I think everything is uh, fine. Okay, so more probably as we have the dedicated team channel. Okay, so we 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 see that uh, like teams sessions and teams uh, conversations are being helpful for the attendees. Okay, so we can move over there as we are nearing up. Uh, you know, like. Because we yeah, have actually, there's, there's a, a question from uh, Matt Thomas, uh, which uh, is how is an associated, associated one, uh, treated one. where there is no yeah. specified direction. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. That's 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 right, uh, but it looks at the source and target uh, uh, ends of the. Um, so, so Letix looks at the source and target ends of um, uh, of a relationship. So even when you don't specify a direction, it's implicitly specified uh, uh, by Letix, uh, by, uh, by Sparks. So. OK, because cool. The, so, the, 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 source tar the source target uh, relationship. It says it says it's unspecified, but it's not really unspecified. But it it means that uh, those relationships uh, in your DSM uh, can uh, end up in the di uh, above or below the diagonal in um, in a reversed order. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a problem. So you have to find those relationships. And I hope there are not too many. Perfect. Okay. So I, I'd I like to uh, thank uh, Klaus for his uh, happy birthday wish. <laughs> sure. So, and uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Jerry uh, especially. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Perfect. So thank you so much for your presentation and uh, hope uh, it is very informative to each and every one of our attendees. Okay, so just give me one quick minute. Yep. And uh, I, I hope Matt uh, have uh, also received uh, uh, a clarification. If not, as we said, like I will, uh, uh, I will put it in. Uh, it will be available teams on the teams. Also, so I will, I will answer every question in Teams. No problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank exactly. you very much, Mohammed, for the, uh, the possibility uh, to have uh, a talk about capuchin monkeys. Um, <laughs> sure. Talk, any, talk any time. Later. Thank you, thank you so much, and thanks, thanks, thanks again to each and everyone. Okay, so uh, um, we'll be meeting you soon with another uh, uh, session as a host, and also like if you would like to uh, drop any feedbacks or if you'd like to, uh, uh, if you have any issues and if you would like to rectify it, then you can. Uh, you are welcome to drop an email to registrations at eaglobalsummit.com. And uh, if you would like to need more clarifications with regards to the presentation, and uh, if you'd like to communicate and collaborate with Han, okay, so you are welcome to do it on the Teams channel link. And see you all soon. Thanks, thanks again. Thanks, Han. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.